go, day two, exciting, right? Thanks very much for being here. Thanks very much to the ThoughtWorks crew for inviting me to speak. Um, it's been a great experience already. Um, I noticed yesterday there were a lot of folks taking photos of slides, so I wanna tell you all these slides will be available to you afterwards. You're also welcome to take photos of them if you like. Um, ThoughtWorks also have a great podcast um, that I recorded an episode for yesterday that goes a bit deeper on some of these uh, things. Um, and I recommend you subscribe if you're not already subscribed. I subscribed yesterday. Today, I get a chance to talk to you a little bit about Slack the product, but maybe more so Slack the company. And it's kind of interesting to be like one company with one product, and that's the sole focus of our efforts. And if I can leave you with a couple of tactical things that have worked for us, that may work for you, that would be success for me. So uh, let's get started with maybe something that inspires us. What good shall I do this day? Does anybody recognize where the quote's from? So this is the sign, or a replica of the sign, that Benjamin Franklin had in his workshop. It was a famous workshop. He was a famous inventor. And this was the task that he set himself every single day. And he invented everything from swim fins to the catheter to bifocal glasses to windshield wipers. He was incredibly prolific. This is a sign that we have at each of our offices around the world. And we think that if we can contribute in a significant way and use that as inspiration, that's an important starting point for us. So the agenda that I put together today for us is just three, I think, fairly simple things, where we come from, how we think about how we work, and then some lessons learned so far. Is there anything anybody wanted to see um, or hear from Slack that wouldn't be covered on that agenda? <laughs> My job is done. Excellent. Well, let's get started. Where we come from. This is a bit of an interesting story, I think. So in 2003, it begins with a game, a game called Game Never Ending. Has anybody heard of Game Never Ending? A lot of shaking heads. One person in the back, thank you. Uh, game Never Ending was not a success. But if you remember 2003, you probably had a mobile phone in your pocket. It was like a Nokia or like a Motorola Razor or something like that. And all of a sudden, you had a camera everywhere that you went. And so Game Never Ending had a photo sharing feature on it that became really popular. That became Flickr. Has anybody heard of Flickr? Yeah, yeah so Flickr, one of the sort of canonical Web 2.0 companies, um, invented all the things that now we take for granted in terms of sharing and tagging and liking, those kinds of things, mechanics of social networks. The same team that built Game Never Ending and built Flickr is the core team that built Slack. So Flickr was acquired in 2006 by Yahoo. They spent three years there, and then they essentially said, you know, we still want to build a game. So it begins with a game again. This game's called Glitch. Has anybody heard of Glitch? Glitch was not a success. <laughs> but over the three years that the team worked on Glitch, there were 55 of them, and they sent a total of 50 emails. And there was, the reason was that they had invented a new way of working together internally, that they knew they wanted to continue working together, and they didn't want to work without this kind of system again. And maybe there were some other folks out there who wanted this kind of system as well. I joined the team as the ninth person uh, kind of in this period of time, and this was the single page website that we launched with in August of 2013, Be Less Busy. Pretty simple promise, but I think a pretty compelling one as well, because 8,000 people signed up in the first 24 hours and 16,000 people signed up in the first week. And I think over the last six years, we've learned quite a bit about what it takes to make modern teams successful. And I think the way that we encapsulate it is more that modern work is more complex than ever and requires sort of the people, the data, and the apps in order to get jobs done. So just think about any job that you want to do. You want to request time off. You need like the people to approve it, the application to track it, and some kind of interface to it. You want to get a contract done. You need the people to approve it, to work on it, the experts. You need the other side. You need back and forth. You need a repository for the data. It takes all three things to get anything done. And the nature of that is really kind of complex in the world today. And I think it's really driven by a few things. First, I think it's that software is eating the world. This is from one of our investors, Mark Andreessen, in 2011. If anything, this has become more true now. This is narrow, deep software systems, systems like crash reporting for your iOS app or analytics for your customer service queue, anything like that, right? Even Salesforce, I always think of as CRM, is actually 14 different products now. So more software runs more and more parts of our organizations all the time, but the software doesn't talk to each other. 
think the second key thing that's driven our success is kind of the people are central to the performance of modern organizations. They make the decisions around like who to hire, how to manage performance, how teams get put together, what are priorities, what aren't priorities. And in a really meaning, meaningful way, you know, 30, 40, 50% of our budgets every year are invested in people directly. And then another 10, 15% in like things to support those people, learning and development, offices and so on. So it's our largest investment year after year. And yet the problem we consistently see with folks is kind of what we think of as an expensive game of telephone. Simple questions are hard to answer. So what's the status on a critical project? Where are we with the numbers? Who's our expert internally on this topic, on hiring, for example? And I think that that's really driven by a lack of a cohesive organizational collaboration strategy. If you don't have a collaboration strategy, you kind of don't know how to solve these problems for yourself. You don't know how to work together. You don't know how to put together the people, the data, and the apps to get the jobs done. And so what tends to happen is on day one, you got your badge for the company and you got your email address. So you email people. But email as a collaboration tactic is incredibly poor and fails to scale to any size of organization. If you want to think about this in a more meaningful way, just think about somebody that you work with every single day. Have you ever seen their inbox? Have they ever seen your inbox? Certainly not, right? Nobody looks at each other's inboxes. But if email is how work gets done inside your organization, you all work from a siloed view of the information that's available and have no clue what anybody else sees. That's the fundamental organizing principle of email, right? It's all private. So Slack takes that where everybody's got their own view, their own silo of what the work that's happening and turns it on its head and says, instead of that, work together in a collaboration hub in channels. Channels pull together people into a common view of the work that's happening and can be private to a small group or open to the organization. They can join halfway through. If you've ever been on a project where you had to join halfway through and you were like, what the heck's going on in this project? A channel is perfect for you because you can actually see who makes decisions, what are the key documents, things like that. It's also software that people use. So people get it right away and it's easy to pick up. It's the best kind of software for IT decision makers because they're able to say, actually, my people are using it a ton. I'm getting a lot of value out of it. And it integrates with all the applications that you're using today. So 1,800 applications, we've got 500,000 active developers. The interesting thing is most developers are not building for the applications in the app directory. Most of them are building for internal systems. ERP systems they acquired as part of a legacy organization. HRIS systems, et cetera. CRMs that are customized to your purposes. Because you've got everything pulled together in one place, you can search, find answers, and it integrates with calling, video calling, voice uh, screen sharing, and so on. That's been successful for us. We've been the fastest growing enterprise software company ever. We've now got over 100,000 paying customers, and that's been a lot of fun. Enough about that. I think Slack replaces the two kind of key roles of email inside an organization, email from computers and email from people. And it creates sort of a cohesive layer across the organization, connecting the people and the applications, that people, data, and apps happening all in one place. So that's where we come from. Let's maybe talk about how we think about how we work. Because the thing that we see consistently is kind of this dual operating model in organizations. We still actually organize the organization as a hierarchy. That's not going anywhere. But we know work gets done in a network, right? You have to work cross-functionally. You have to work with people you don't know. You have to pick up job tasks with different people at different times. You have to put that together to solve the job. And so that's kind of the situation we're in. And so for us, driven right from the top, is the desire to work together as a competitive advantage. This is actually from our CEO, Stuart. I want the way we work together to be a competitive advantage. And so a couple of the things that we use as sort of mental shortcuts for that are assumptions. So the assumption, the first one, is assume that change is hard and happens every day. We have kind of this lizard brain lie that we tell ourselves that the world is stable and unchanging because we have to get through the day. But the reality is it's incredibly changing all the time, right? And we can be agents of that change. The second assumption is everyone starts with good intentions. So when you're working with somebody for the first time, you have to default to that good intentions. That was incredibly important for us. And the two things that drive our organization are innovation and culture. And when I talk about innovation, I mean how changes happen and their effects. And when I talk about culture, I talk about how we do things here. So those are pretty simple things for big words that get a lot of attention and a lot of miscommunication, I think. That's how we think about them. And in terms of innovation, we talk about selling the product, not selling, selling the innovation, I'm sorry, not the product. This is from an essay that's live on the web right now, as you can see. I'll also pass along a reading list at the end um, where you can check out these things if you want to go deeper. But the key, I think, phrase is this one, the best, maybe the only real direct measure of innovation is change in human behavior. 
Because as soon as we get any kind of depth with a customer, they're like, Slack isn't really a technology project. Slack is a change project. And so how can we help customers help themselves? And how can we internally help our organization drive that as well? Is a key kind of business for us. And the thing that we've learned is that innovation is a stochastic process. So it's a fancy word. It means based on probabilities. We face these kinds of things all the time, right? We probably got up this morning and looked at the weather report. So what is the chance of precipitation? 70% based on probabilities. If anybody's ever laid a wager, there was a casino we went past last night based on probabilities, right? So that's not anything new. A plus B equals 70% chance of C. And we know that in times of change, we can influence those probabilities. And so how do we drive that influence so that we maximize the probabilities as much as possible? It's actually quite well researched, um, which is a comfort for us. And there's three key things, a growth mindset, a curiosity to build a broad repertoire, and empathy for customers. I'll break those down a little bit just quickly about how we think about them. Growth mindset favors errors of commission versus errors of omission. It's more important to try the thing and fail than it is to never try. You learn way more by doing things than by observing. And a good sort of mental trick, if you're having trouble getting started, is to think back to your own career and think like, you know, two years ago I had to run this project and I didn't know how to hire the people and I didn't know how to get the budget and I didn't know what the success metrics were. And all those things that you didn't know or didn't have the ability to solve at the time add yet to the end. I didn't know how to hire the people yet. I didn't know how to set the metrics yet. I didn't know how to get the budget yet. Because you face those challenges today too, right? There's lots of things we don't know how to do in our work. And so how do we grow into those sort of supported by the things that we've done in the past. So curiosity to build a broad repertoire. Are people familiar with the, like the, the word repertoire? It's like a portfolio of experiences. So this is why diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams. They have a broader repertoire to draw from. So the dirty little secret of innovation is that innovation is not invention. Innovation is mostly the application of existing tactics in new problem spaces. So the broader the repertoire of people involved in your project, in your team, anything like that, the more diverse the perspectives that they can draw on and bring to bear on the problem. And then empathy for customers. So we make decisions on behalf, and we, I mean the collective we, make decisions on behalf of customers all the time, right? How are we gonna write our invoices? How are we going to manage the queue for customer service? Those are decisions that we're making on behalf of customers all the time. And so we need that feeling orientation of what is the customer feeling in the time that we're, I'm making decisions on their behalf. So what are they feeling when they're trying to read the invoice? They want clarity, they want it to reflect their conversations, right? What are they feeling when they're actually trying to get help? Probably the problem started a while ago and it's just come to a boil and so now they're actually dealing with it, right? So how do we feel what the customer is feeling and that empathy in order to use it as a guidance for us? Okay, enough of that. On culture. This is another essay that's live on the web right now, written by one of our senior engineers, Nolan Cottle, and we were about 60 people. And the key kind of phrase is every company builds two things, the products they sell and the culture inside the company. And everything in the company is oriented towards the first thing, right? That's all the instrumentation, that's all the prioritization, all the projects run around that. There's very few that actually run around the culture of the company. And so we wanted to build a company that did both things in equal measure because culture is shared practices made of habits. Because I think there's so much freighting in the word culture that people are all talking about different things, but when you talk about habits, it actually breaks it down to much more concrete things. What are the things you do every single day? What are the things as an organization we do every single day? Because we are what we repeatedly do, right? This is a great phrase that I love um, that I actually can never find the attribution to, so it's unattributed right now. It was on the wall of a gym. But I think for us, it's really important to be, think about that and to think about culture on two axes. And this is a bit hard to see, but your culture lives between what you celebrate and what you tolerate, and your culture is what you do. And so for us, there are three kind of key stories around that to make culture as explicit and as celebrated as possible, top right. So the first one is be the dog. How do you invest yourself in the job so thoroughly that you're just like doing it? How do we take things out of the equation as much as possible so that you can just invest yourself in that flow state, like a dog hunting or running or anything like that. They don't care about anything else. They're not feeling anxious. The second thing was driven actually by a big mistake that we made, which is we hired too many people too quickly. So that's a boa constrictor who's eaten a goat. 
And so the story for us goes, eat the goat. Sometimes you just have to work through something and stop. The third story is hug the elephant in the room. So how do you make the thing that everybody knows or the thing that you might think that everybody knows into an explicit conversation? So those are canonical stories for us that we come back to over and over again to make culture into real things and into habits. So maybe five lessons learned quickly in terms of mission and values, in terms of attributes, in terms of risk, decisions, and alignment. So mission and, mission and values. Um, when we were about 30 people, which seems like a really small organization now, we're about 2,000 people, um, we got together as a senior leadership team and essentially we were up to our necks in work. We couldn't like keep up with anything. And we took two days and went to Sonoma and we were gonna like do our mission and values and it was lovely and everything like that. And it was the last thing I thought at the time that we really needed. But it's been incredibly valuable because we've hired another 1,970 people since then and we've had to help them understand what our culture is about. And so codifying it was incredibly important. So this is the mission and values that we came up with at the time to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, more productive, and six values. And for us, the mission and the values have to be lived. And I think that that's a bit trite to say that because everybody says it, so I'll give you some examples. So in terms of mythologizing it, you have to then put it into practice in the stories that you tell each other. So I did a quick search in our Slack, making on-call making on Slack simpler, pleasant, and more productive. Here are examples where you actually see the mission being put into practice for how people think about their work internally or externally. And if you're really successful, it gets shortened. So SPP is what people say now. In terms of craftsmanship as a value, it's pretty abstract, right? We talk about painting the back of the drawer. So how do you know that you've done a good job and the full job, right? In terms of um, solidarity, we use the phrase, we're all in this together. So when you have a tough conversation with somebody, that's a way of saying, like, we still belong together, we share a future, we're all in this together, but I'm delivering some tough news to you right now. And in terms of, oh, we're all in this together again, sorry. In terms of attributes, what we actually found was that um, the values were too abstract for people. So they actually had to get more concrete. So we actually then created four attributes. And there's gonna be a lot of words on the screen that I'll let you read just for a second here. But really we had to work at making what Slack, what, uh, what a successful Slack employee meant um, in four key dimensions. So smart, hardworking, humble, and collaborative. Then there's specific words around that. And I think for us, that was really key to be able to unpack for people and then to have them echo it back, right? So how do you do that? This is on the job description. This is in the footer of every single job description that we have. We acquired a company in Pune, India, and this is how they essentially started working on Slack. They held an open house and reviewed what are the four attributes. So when those start having resonance with your organization, I think that that's really important and that's a key measure for your senior leadership team about whether you're landing with that or not. The screensaver in all of our meeting rooms echoes back how smart, humble, hardworking, collaborative shows up in meetings. And when you do the scorecard for an evaluation for a job, here is a mix, actually, of values and attributes. But those are key things that we look for when we're trying to drive um, hiring, performance, anything like that. Okay, risk. We all don't want to do lots of things, right? We all take on new things. We don't know what's going to happen. We haven't solved that problem yet. So how do we essentially trick our brain to start solving that problem before it actually faces it? So we created the pre-mortem. Has anybody heard of a pre-mortem? So pre-mortems are reasonably well understood. Um, three key dimensions, what will go wrong, how will it go wrong, why will it go wrong, and then three perspectives too. Incredibly important to get out of your own head. So every single person on a project does this at the beginning at the kickoff of a project and then re revisit it every month, every two months or something like that. And you do it independently and then you come together and you bring it together. Again, why diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams, broader perspectives. And we actually found that this was a little too limited, so we added two columns. What's the consequence if it goes wrong? What's the probability it will go wrong? We update those on a consistent basis um, so that you can actually start seeing how you do that. Because what's the scariest monster in the room? The scariest monster is the one you've never seen, right? 
So how do you diagnose a problem or start thinking about things, start tricking your brain to thinking about them before you even start addressing them? This is what we've found has been really, really effective, and it also gives you a language to talk about the things that are gonna go wrong if they go wrong. So no longer is the messenger shot as the person who brought that up, oh yeah, don't talk to Jim. He's the one who like talks about all that thing that is like, you know, we all know is going badly with the project. In terms of decision making, um, we have a phrase called disagree and commit that we've actually taken from a book called High Performance Management by Andy Grove, one of the founders of Intel. Amazon has it in their culture as well. Because when you get together to make decisions after you've done your pre-mortem, you're then reflecting back to how you do things, you're reflecting back to what are the challenges. What happens when people who are closest to the work have the most information about it, don't feel like they have the power to make the decision? Has anybody ever been in the meeting where the high status person is asked what their opinion is? Right, what do you think? So disagree and commit is actually an ego saving phrase for the high status person to say that it's more important for this to go ahead than it is for me to get my way. And this is the thing that it's working to avoid. Because if you don't do this, high status people tend to fill the role, right? You get asked, I'll make a decision for us. And then in terms of alignment, we're consistently asking ourselves, what are we optimizing for? And it's a great way to work cross-functionally because then you can actually identify what you're optimizing for. Is it like speed? Is it reliability? Is it um, testing? Is it experimentation? And then you can be aligned on that as you move through the process. And the best kind of way of thinking about this is that if you don't get alignment on what you're optimizing for, you end up with a very, a very good solution that doesn't address the problem. So I hope that's been helpful for you, and I hope you find it inspiring. What good shall you do today? Thank you very much.